We are going to be talking about the topic of Jesus-shaped cultures, uh, the historical impact of the gospel. And I find that this is very helpful for us to, you know, and I do a lot of work on the moral argument for God's existence, uh, but it's important not just to have a nice theoretical fit between God and objective moral values and human dignity and so forth, but actually to have a historical reinforcement to see the impact of the gospel in history. So it, it's, there, it's fleshed out in the lives of believers who have brought about remarkable changes through the impact that they have had in their families, communities, indeed um, countries and civilization even. You may be familiar with the new atheist, uh, Christopher Hitchens, who in his book, God is Not Great, claims that religion poisons everything. Now, one big problem is what do we mean by religion? And uh, <clears throat> here's a picture of my wife and me and uh, our son Peter and daughter Valerie who are in San Diego at the American Academy of Religion. And there was Martin Marty, uh, an expert on religion. And he has said that there are at least 17 distinct definitions of religion and that scholars will not agree on any one definition. So in light of this claim that religion causes all this trouble, well, it'd be good to know what we're, what, how we're referring to religion, what we mean by religion when we're actually critiquing it. Well, let me make a few comments on religion. Now you've seen this bumper sticker, visualize world peace. Well, we're gonna talk about uh, visualizing worldview peas, all right? So we're gonna talk about some worldview peas here. And uh, what we want to do is talk about the presumption of a worldview. I think it's more helpful to talk about, a, about worldview than it is to talk about religion. For one thing, everybody has a worldview. No one can escape it. Everyone has a view on what is real, on knowledge, on ethics. And a lot of people think, oh, I'm an atheist. I'm in a default position. I don't have to justify my viewpoint when in actual fact, everyone takes a stance on things and therefore everyone ought to be able to justify the position that he takes, whether he's an atheist quote, or quote unquote secularist or quote unquote religious person. So we can't simply assume a worldview as though this is the ordinary, normal, default viewpoint to take, and everybody else bears the burden of proof. No, everyone takes a stance, and there, everyone, therefore everyone ought to take, uh, you know, ought to be able to justify those stances. Also, uh, picking your poisoning. Uh, religion poisons, Christopher Hitchens says. Well, atheism has done its share of poisoning. Why can't we rule out atheism? based on what Stalin and Mao and Tsitong and Pol Pot did. Uh, you know, Mao Tsitong and Pol Pot did. Here we have all sorts of horrendous things done in the name of religion, but you often find that the new atheists have been reluctant to attribute that to atheism per se. I remember hearing Christopher Hitchens say at a debate that Stalin was kind of like a religious figure. You know, we like to do that. It was just a, kind of a, a silly uh, diminishing of the, I think, the, the, the point that the, uh, the quote unquote religious critic makes toward the atheist uh, claim uh, like Richard, Christopher Hitchens has made. Also, it's important to, that we understand that we, that we perceive our flaws. The Bible makes clear that we are all flawed and fallible and in need of God's grace, as we indeed heard this morning in Peter Williams' talk, uh, that we recognize that we are all fallen and flawed. And it's not just something that is particular to the religious person. It is across the board, atheists included. Also, uh, parsing religions. Keep in mind that not all traditional religions are created equal. Think, for example, of the gospel, where there is salvation by grace as opposed to self-salvation. Think of the burden that is lifted off of the Christian when he recognizes that Jesus Christ has borne that burden of rescuing us. Or dimitude in Islam. We can talk about the caste system in India. Again, there are, there are remarkable differences and we shouldn't just paper over them in the name of all religions are bad or something like that. 
um, presuming hypocrisy. Uh, we are not denying uh, bad things done in the name of God or Christ. In fact, Jesus himself predicted these sorts of things. You see, if you assume that hypocrisy, and, and uh, people like Richard Dawkins are always pointing out things that, uh, that religious people, Christians do and so forth. No, well, if you are going to look at hypocrisy within any worldview, you'll find it universally. People will not live up to the standards that they profess. And does that mean that we shouldn't believe anything? <laughs> that there is no worldview position to take? No, not at all. Uh, the question is, uh, where are we looking in terms of the source, the authentic, the real article? You know, we're talking about Jesus, who e indeed predicted that people would do all sorts of terrible things in his, in his name or in the name of God. But the question is, is Jesus to be trusted? You know, his followers may not uh, fall in line all the time, but what about Jesus himself? There we have the real article, the trustworthy person. Uh, and so, so we need to look to the source rather than to those who are maybe just professing and not living up to what Jesus commanded. Also, we need to keep in mind a, a related point that possessing is important, not simply professing. It might be helpful to look at how believers live, professing believers live in difficult places where it's tough to be a Christian as opposed to where it's very easy to get away with being a Christian and living like a relativist. You know, so you know, or calling yourself a Christian and really not making much of a difference in the world. Now, here's something. Richard Dawkins has come to make some distinctions of late that not all religions are, you know, that some religions aren't as bad as others. And so he says, there are no Christians, as far as I know, blowing up buildings. I'm not aware of any Christian suicide bombers. I'm not aware of any major Christian denomination that believes the penalty for apostasy is death. I have mixed feelings about the decline of Christianity, insofar as Christianity might be a bulwark against something worse. Wow, so maybe secularism isn't going to be that bulwark after all. Maybe something like the Christian faith uh, has potential for being that bulwark. Richard Dawkins at the Hay Festival in 2014 said he could describe himself as a secular Christian in that he had this feeling of nostalgia for certain Christian traditions and ceremonies and so forth. Very interesting. Now, what I want to do as we talk about this topic of Jesus-shaped cultures is to look at what happens when people faithfully follow Jesus Christ, when they're consistently living out their message and not simply wearing the Christian label. So as we look at the topic, uh, you know, at this uh, issue today, I want to give, here's just a brief overview. I want to look at worldview and practice or roots, shoots, and fruits. Uh, secondly, we want to look at the trans uh, transformation in history, uh, how faithful Jesus followers have shaped culture. Uh, and then in the last portion, looking at Christianity and the critics, a uh, reinforcement that comes actually from non-theistic scholars who attribute genuine civilizational societal change to the Christian worldview. Now, many of us are cultural trust fund kids in the West, that we are actually heirs to hard fought gains brought to us by courageous, dedicated Christians who have followed Jesus. We are so often taking for granted what has gone before us, that we are sitting on this wealth and simply assuming that it's always going to be there. Which brings us to the topic of worldview and the roots, shoots, and fruits. What do we mean by this? Well, consider what a friend of mine, Tom Wolfe, calls the world voice, which is the, uh, the model religious or philosophical spokesperson, or even a worship deity to whose voice we listen. Jesus, Muhammad, Buddha, Shiva, Marx, that we listen to that voice. Those are the roots. But then that takes shape, gives shape to a worldview, the outlook, the, the philosophical, religious, intellectual precepts, as well as the heart commitment that goes along with that. That's what we can call the worldview. This is the expression of that, the shoots. But then there are actually practices that come out of that, 
certain outworkings of behaviors and, uh, and, uh, and traditions and, and you know, practices and so forth that are concrete and visible to people who are observing that we can call the fruits. So we've got the roots, we've got the shoots, we've got the fruits. Well, think of abortion, the caste system, racism, apartheid, dimitude, sexual and human slavery. Now, it's not as though we're saying we in the West, we're, we're just doing so great and look at the non-Western world where they don't have these sorts of democratic structures and so forth. No, uh, uh, as a friend of mine, Tom Wolf pictured there says, uh, while all cultures are sick, some are sicker than others. Now in a multicultural world, people don't like to talk that way, but clearly there are some, there are flaws in all cultures. But we have to ask the question, why are some cultures more change prone instead of change resistant? Well, I think we have to consider the voices that we listen to. Think of the biblical voices of Genesis 1:27, God creating man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. Jesus in Matthew 7, 12 says, in everything therefore treat the, the people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets, uh, the golden rule, uh, or basically a, uh, a revising of love your neighbor as yourself. Now there's the Hindu voice, uh, the book of Manu, where not all are created equal, where you have the caste system uh, up the, the Brahmin at the top and then down at the very bottom, uh, the Dalits, those who have no, uh, no status. Uh, there are, you are born this way. There's nothing you can do to change it. If you try to change it, you may be jeopardizing your karma in the next life. And if you try to help someone who's a Dalit, you may, you, know, you may be jeopardizing your own status in the future because you are helping someone who deserves to be exactly where he is. B.R. Ambedkar, the author of the Indian Constitution, burned this book of Manu, institutionalizing the caste system uh, within it, uh, calling it a holy lie. And he burned it on Christmas Day. 1927, very interesting, isn't it? Is an obvious connection to the Christian faith. And he said, Hindu society seems to me to stand in need of a moral regeneration that is dangerous to postpone. A moral regeneration, very powerful language. No, just, no tinkering at the edges, something revolutionary. The, in 1873, the Indian reformer Mahatma Phule, who studied at a Scottish mission school, notice the connection to the J, the Jesus influence. Uh, he said, followers of the Bali Raja, the sacrifice king, Jesus, came to India, preached and practiced the true teaching of their Messiah among the Shudras, the backward castes here. Thus, they emancipated the Shudras from the unnatural and inhuman slavery, which was imposed by the wicked Brahmins. In fact, he so admired Abraham Lincoln and the overthrow of slavery in America that he dedicated a book that he wrote to the American people in light of the, you know, the, the, in the wake of this, the Civil War and the eradication of slavery. In India, let's take a look there and see, I think, a, a significant contrast. Kancha Elaya, this activist, author, reformer, says within Hinduism, there is no appreciation per se of a healthy man-woman relationship which is rooted in the concept of equality. In this article, which is available online, uh, he says, we also have the god Shiva, who insisted on entering the bathing arena of goddess Parvati and did so by eliminating a child who was keeping guard at the open door. He says, Lord Krishna stole the clothes of women while they were bathing in the Yamuna River. He did so to tease them and for the pleasure of watching the beauty of their naked bodies. We hang miniature paintings of the same act in our homes proudly. The young men who grow up seeing this or listening to the story told in an amused tone are bound not to find such an act abhorrent. I actually spoke on this in England and uh, a Hindu or someone who grew up in India, not a Hindu, but he uh, was an atheist. Uh, but he said, you know, you're, you're twisting this because Krishna, he grows up later. And we, have, of course, have the Bhagavad Gita, which tells the story of a mature Krishna, 
But of course, the problem is here, they're, they're still hanging up these pictures of the young Krishna doing all these sorts of things as though there's no problem with this. So again, the, the youthful Krishna is still being celebrated throughout India. Our mythology, he says, does not tell us what a husband, that what a husband, he tells us what a husband does is right and his will is greater than the woman's. If a mythological hero is praised for his acts of killing, drinking, and fornicating with multiple women, it is glorification of such behavior. The Indian Supreme Court judge Ram Jetmalani says that Ram, the, after whom he was named, the God after whom he was named, says he was a bad husband. I don't like him at all. The god Ram had sent his virtuous wife Sita into exile because a washerman slandered her, and so Ram listened to him instead of trusting his virtuous wife. There is also the worship of the lingam, uh, the male sexual organ or phallus of the lustful Hindu god Shiva. In India, there are 30 million such stones or statues in, in Indian temples uh, and shrines and so forth. Uh, and so you have these represent Shiva's sexual union with the goddess Parvati. And worshippers will bathe, offer flowers, and pray to these linga idols. So there is this glorification of this god Shiva and his sexual prowess and so forth. You see, in Hindu theology, when gods strike, when gods engage with women, it is to strike or curse them or to use them as sexual objects. So it is not surprising to see that there is an impact, a social impact that comes. You think of the roots, the shoots and the fruits. Uh, could, could, it, could it not be? And I, I think a good case can be made that the presumed lesser value of women and the girl child have resulted in over 60 million missing women in India through this gender side. Males outnumber females by 37 million, uh, at least at the time of this, uh, the writing of this book, India Dishonored. Well, that gives you a little bit of a, con a, a, a context as well as a contrast here. And what I'd like to do now is look at the Christian faith in particular to see how the roots of the Christian faith gave rise to the shoots and then the fruits of transformation in history, how faithful Jesus followers have transformed culture. In the West, we're living off the fumes of Christendom, largely shaped by persons dedicated to living out the biblical message. Think of a house that has been built. You just come into it, you turn on the lights, the plumbing works, the Wi-Fi works, the, you know, you know, everything is sound, the, you, know, you stay warm you know, in the winter, uh, you stay, you know, the heaters work and you stay, you know, and, it, and it keeps you cozy. The air conditioner works in the, in the summertime. And we just presume these things just work. And I think civilizationally, we're, walking, we've, we're all walking into this house in the West in flipping on the light switch, everything is working, everything seems to be functioning well. We've got democracy, we've got human rights, we've got equality before the law, we've got, all sort, we've got literacy and, 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 and books and so forth. Well, you remove the Christian influence and you don't have that anymore. We just presume that that house is just gonna stay there, that there needs to be no maintenance and so forth. No, it is actually those who are motivated to build that house, to keep things going, to, to finesse and fine tune and to press for uh, greater, you know, greater improvements. Well, when you don't have that transformed heart, it's gonna be very difficult to actually have that motivation to keep things up or to begin building in the first place. So let's talk about these transformations. First, the transformation of uh, culture in the early church era in the Middle Ages, and we have to move uh, fairly quickly here. Transformation through reformation, uh, democracy, education, and moral reforms, and then transformation in the modern era, science, bioethics, and human rights. So let's talk about the, uh, the early church era and the Middle Ages. In the second century, the epistle to Diognetus uh, talks about Christians dwelling in their own countries, but simply as sojourners. As citizens, they share in all things with others, yet endure all things as if foreigners. They have a common table, but not a common bed. They are in the flesh, but they do not live after the flesh. They pass their days on earth, but they are citizens of heaven. They obey the prescribed laws and at the same time surpass the laws by their lives. They love all men and are persecuted by all. They are unknown and condemned. They are put to death and restored to life. They are poor, yet make many rich. They are in lack of all things, and yet abound in all. They are glorified, and yet in their very dishonor are glorified." So 
We have Emperor Julian uh, in, a, in a, succe a succeeding century, Julian the Apostate, who is hostile toward Christians, who is upset that Christians are really outdoing the pagans. In fact, they're helping the pagans, not just their own. So they, they show benevolence to strangers. They care for the graves of the dead and the pretended holiness of their lives that have done the most to increase atheism, that is, belief, you know, disbelief in the pantheon of pagan deities. It's disgraceful that when no Jew ever has to beg and the impious Galileans or Christians support not only their own poor, but ours as well. All men see that our people lack aid from us. This is the Christian influence. There were moral and social reforms, outlawing gladiatorial games, prohibiting child abandonment and infanticide, creation of hospices, creation of hospitals motivated by Jesus' words, I was sick and you looked after me. Missionary endeavors and church planting. St. Patrick, for example, in the fifth century going to Ireland where he was once a slave, planting 700 churches, ordaining up to 1,000 priests with 150 Celtic tribes becoming largely Christianized. Then there's copying and preserving manuscripts and promoting learning. And there's that book, How the Irish Saved Civilization, which documents that. There is the establishment of universities and centers of learning in the Middle Ages. Not only this, there's technological advancement, horsepower, the horseshoe, harnessing, water power, wheelbarrow, eyeglasses, clocks, and so forth. And one author says the chief glory of the later Middle Ages was not its cathedrals or its scholasticism. It was the building for the first time in history of a complex civilization which rested not on the backs of sweating slaves or coolies, but primarily on non-human power. Now that is remarkable, showing the, you know, respecting the dignity of the individual human being. The Oxford Symposium on Scientific Change in 1961 concluded that the Christian beliefs provided the rationale and faith, the motive energy for Western technology. So that's just a brief overview. It's overview could say a lot more, but uh, let us press on. Uh, I know we've, we've all had lunch and, uh, and as uh, G.K. Chesterton said, about an hour or two after lunch, a person's worldview starts to change. Uh, but uh, we'll try to uh, keep things moving along here, so stick with me. All right, so uh, we have in the, you know, in, in, in the wake of the Reformation, democracy, education, and moral reforms. Now, we're all familiar with the Protestant Reformation starting in 1517, we just celebrated the 500th anniversary last year, and it focused on three core transformative values that have really shaped uh, the modern era. Uh, first of all is the priesthood of all believers. Uh, we read that, you know, the, that we are a kingdom and priests to our God in, in, the, in the scriptures through Jesus Christ. So the, instead of the hierarchical Roman Catholicism or Eastern Orthodoxy, we see a fundamental democratization of the people of God, the priesthood of all believers. But there's more. Also, the Bible was to be put into the vernacular, the right of every believer to study the Bible for himself in his own language. And of course, Martin Luther undertook the translation of the scriptures into German. And then finally, the goodness of vocations, that, the, that any honest vocation could be appropriately carried out to the glory of God. Now, these keep those three values in mind as we look at some of the findings of the sociologist uh, uh, Robert Woodbury. Uh, in his article, you can find it online, excellent article, would commend it to you, The Missionary Roots of Liberal Democracy. He talks about conversionary Protestants or uh, missionaries, basically. Conversionary Protestant Christians in particular were responsible for these remarkable gains. The development and spread of religious liberty, mass education, mass printing, volunteer organizations, most major colonial reforms, abolishing slavery, widow burning, foot binding, female circumcision, prepubescent marriage of girls, etc., and the codification of legal protections for non-whites in the 19th and early 20th centuries. He says, areas where Protestant missionaries had a significant presence in the past are on average more economically developed today with comparatively better health, lower infant mortality, lower corruption, greater literacy, higher educational attainment, especially for women, and more robust membership in non-governmental organizations. Furthermore, these Protestant missionaries sought to protect indigenous peoples from abusive colonial powers. A lot of people think, oh, those missionaries, they're just part of the colonial problem. 
No, they're actually, they were the ones who were in between the colonial powers and the indigenous peoples trying to press for equality before the law for both sides. So they're selected often, these missionaries were selected as judges to punish or reprimand military officials or magistrates in cases of murder, land seizure, and forced labor. They sought to apply the same legal standards for whites and non-whites. They documented colonial atrocities through detailed information and then later through photographs. Robert Woodbury said, without Protestant missionaries and ministers, mobilizing mass protests would have been difficult. These missionaries helped create a kind of cocoon in which nonviolent indigenous political movements could develop to press for democracy and decolonialization. Now here's a, here's a, a challenge from Robert uh, Woodbury. He says, look at any map. He says, where Protestant missionaries have been and Protestantism in general, there you will find more printed books and more schools per capita. You'll discover that in Africa, the Middle East, and parts of Asia, most of the early nationalists who led their countries to independence graduated from Protestant mission schools. There's also statistical evidence that indicates Protestant to the Protestantism Democracy Association. Woodbury argues that Protestantism facilitated the development of modern representative democracy, that stable democracy first emerged in Protestant Europe and British settler colonies. And by World War I, every independent, predominantly Protestant country was a stable democracy, with the possible exception of Germany. Less stable versions of democracy developed in Catholic areas with large Protestant and Jansenist, you know, rooted in Augustinian uh, theology, and uh, Blaise Pascal was a Jansenist, and a lot of people didn't like the Jansenist, a lot of Catholics didn't like the Jansenist because they sounded, they sounded a lot like the reformers. Um, but, uh, but anyway, in France, you have a, a more stable democracy there because of that Protestant influence. Democracy lagged in Catholic and Orthodox parts of Southern and Eastern Europe where Protestants had little influence and a similar pattern existed outside of Europe as well. So it's interesting, a lot of people have said, or a little raised a skeptical eyebrow, but Woodbury's thesis that Protestant missionaries were moral and social change agents has held up under rigorous scrutiny. That, uh, that uh, various noted sociologists and historians have pointed to the, the you know, again, the soundness of this, uh, of this argument. And also the, uh, the um, American Political Science Review required an additional 192 pages of supporting documentation before they would publish Woodbury's article. And then, you know, it is also won uh, various, uh, various awards, uh, you know, including the L uh, Lubert uh, um, Article Award for the best article in comparative politics. Again, you have others who, you know, again, here's, a, here's a, the atheist historian who, uh, Neil Ferguson, who says there's a connection between Protestantism and a strong work ethic, one of the six killer apps that propelled the West forward as a civilization. Um, also mentions other benefits there as well. But some people might say, well, what about Greek democracy? What about the Renaissance? What about Enlightenment influences? Why couldn't these explain the rise of democracy and, 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 and other, uh, other such gains? Well, again, I'll have to be brief here. I've done some writing on this, but I'll just have to give you the short version here. All of these are fundamentally inadequate explanations. For one thing, Greek democracy was not democratic as we know it today. It was founded on uh, the backs of slaves. It was very hierarchical and aristocratic and so forth. And Aristotle called slaves you know, basically animated tools, uh, that they, you're born that way. Some are born to rule, some are born to serve, etc. The Renaissance was fundamentally Christian. Uh, the study, you know, humanism was really the study of the humanities. Uh, it was kind of like the Puritan John Milton who appropriated, par uh, appropriated pagan figures and images and stories and so forth in his Paradise Lost, even though he was a Puritan poet. What about the Enlightenment? Uh, well, many of its figures were shaped by Protestantism, Rousseau, Locke, Grotius, and others. They grew up in Calvinistic or Protestant homes and, and thus were shaped by the values of Protestantism. So again, to say that the Enlightenment changed it all, uh, again, fails to see the Christian roots there. Let me just say something briefly about transformation in the modern era, and then we'll go on to talk about the, uh, what the non-Christian uh, scholars have to say about this. Uh, what are some other distinctively Christian contributions to the world? Well, modern science. Keep in mind the, that the pillars of modern science who believed in the Bible, divine design, and the possibility of miracles, they were the ones who established modern science and its presuppositions. Newton, Kepler, Copernicus, Galileo, Boyle. Uh, 
We go on Faraday, Maxwell, Perkins, Stokes, uh, William Thompson, uh, uh, J.J. Thompson. And if you want to read more about this, there is the Dictionary of Christianity and Science that talks a lot about these figures, so you may want to want to check that out. But here, J.J. Thompson, who discovered the electron, identified the electron, placed over this door in the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge the, the scripture verse, Great are the works of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in them. A marvelous, marvelous text for the scientist. Paul Davies, a noted writer, a physicist, says science began as an outgrowth of theology and all scientists, whether atheists or theists, accept an essentially theological worldview. That is, they assume that human beings have the capacity to understand the world, to detect patterns, uh, to see, you know, to, to, to weigh things, to use their own logical minds to understand how things work. Uh, this is, you know, again, these are fundamentally theological assumptions. It fits very nicely within a theistic framework. Rodney Stark, the sociologist, says the roots of science have rested on religious foundations and the people who brought it about were devout Christians. Then there's bioethics. Uh, again, in light of the encroachments of technology and medicine upon the dignity of the human person, a number of Christians rose up to defend the integrity of humanity. Uh, in light of their Christian convictions, Daniel Callahan being one of them. He says, when I first became interested in bioethics in the mid-1960s, the only resources for theological were theological or those drawn from within the traditions of medicine, themselves heavily shaped by religion. And there are others uh, we could appeal to, Paul Ramsey and so forth. Uh, but let me move on to talk about human rights. Of course, we're familiar with the Declaration of Independence, which connects God and the, these unalienable rights that human beings have, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. And by that, they didn't mean some sort of hedonism, uh, but rather they meant this kind of a pursuit of virtue that, you know, in the classical sense that Aristotle talked about, the sense of well-being and human flourishing. Um, also, France, even, in its Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, uh, talked about these rights in the presence and under the auspices of the supreme being. There's this connection between the two. The United Nations Universal Declaration on Human Rights talks about how all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They're endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. Well, who put this document together? Well, the Harvard legal scholar Marianne Glendon said that in light of the Nazi and Japanese atrocities of the Second World War, church coalitions and individual Christian leaders worked closely with some Jewish rabbis to craft this language. And they used that term endowed but without mentioning God because atheistic states like the USSR, they wanted them to sign on to that. But Max Stackhouse of Princeton says that intellectual honesty demands recognition of the fact that what passes as secular Western principles of basic human rights develop nowhere else than out of key strands of the biblically rooted religion. But just don't take their word for it. Talk about non theistic scholars who actually reinforce this point. And Jürgen Habermas is one of them, a leading philosopher in, uh, in Europe, in Germany. He says, Christianity has functioned for the normative self-understanding of modernity as more than just a precursor or a catalyst. Egalitarian universalism, from which sprang the ideas of freedom and social solidarity, of an autonomous conduct of life and emancipation, the individual morality of conscience, human rights, and democracy is the direct heir to the Judaic ethic of justice and the Christian ethic of love. And he says, any other attempt to explain this away is just idle postmodern talk. There's uh, atheist Jacques Derrida, a philosopher who says, the concept of crime against humanity is a Christian concept, and I think there would be no such thing in the law today without the Christian heritage, the Abrahamic heritage, the biblical heritage. The agnostic philosopher Luc Ferry says that the Christian idea of human equality was unprecedented at the time and one to which our world owes its entire democratic inheritance. But then there are non-Westerners who also make these sorts of claims. Uh, David Aikman, a Time News correspondent, uh, attended a Chinese lecture uh, in which the lecturer from the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences was speaking to a group of U.S. tourists. And this is what he said. One of the things we were asked to look into was what accounted for the success, in fact, the preeminence of the West all over the world. We studied everything we could from the historical, political, economic, cult, and cultural perspective. At first, we thought it was because you had more powerful guns than we had. Then we thought it was because you had the best political system. 
Next, we focused on the economic system. But in the past 20 years, we have realized that the heart of your culture is your religion, Christianity. That is why the West has been so powerful. The Christian moral foundation of social and cultural life was what made possible the emergence of capitalism and then the successful transition to democratic politics. We don't have any doubt about this. The social scientist, uh, uh, political scientist Gunter Levy says that the adherents of a naturalistic ethic are not likely to produce a Dorothy Day or a Mother Teresa. Many of these people love humanity, but not individual human beings with all their failings and shortcomings. They will be found participating in demonstrations for causes such as nuclear disarmament, but not sitting at the bedside of a dying person. An ethic of moral autonomy and individual rights so important to secular liberals is incapable of sustaining and nourishing values such as altruism and self-sacrifice. Then there's Malcolm Muggeridge before he uh, became a Christian when he was an agnostic journalist in India and Africa. He said, while in India and Africa, he witnessed much righteous endeavor undertaken by Christians of all denominations. However, he added, I never, as it happens, came across a hospital or an orphanage run by the Fabian, the Socialist Society, or a humanist leper colony. And then there is the, uh, the observation of Brian Stewart over decades of doing journalistic worth, work for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. He said, I have found that there is no movement or force closer to the raw truth of war, famines, crises, and the vast human predicament than organized Christianity in action. There is no alliance more determined and dogged in action than church workers ordained and lay members when mobilized for a common good. It is these Christians who are right on the front lines of committed humanity today. And when I want to find that front, I follow their trail. He says, it is a vast front stretching from the most impoverished reaches to the, of the developing world to the hectic struggle to preserve caring values in our own towns and cities. I have never been able to reach these front lines without finding Christian volunteers already in the thick of it, mobilizing congregations that care, and being a faithful witness to truth, the primary light in the darkness, and so often the only light. He says, now I came to this admiring view slowly and reluctantly. At the start of my career, I'd largely abandoned religion for I too regarded the church as a rather tiresome irrelevance. What ultimately persuaded me otherwise, and I took a lot of persuading, was the reality of Christianity's mission physically and in spirit before my very eyes. I'm often asked if I lost belief in God covering events like Ethiopia, then called the worst hell on earth. Actually, like others before me, it was precisely in such hells that I rediscovered religion. I saw so many countless acts of human love and charity, total respect for the most forsaken, for all of life. Well, let's offer a few summary thoughts here. Uh, some people say, well, just because you have nice people doing good things doesn't prove that their belief system is correct. And, and sure, we can, we, can, we can acknowledge that that is, uh, that is the case, that you can have, for example, have Mormons whose uh, theology is very faulty and you know, they could be nice people, you know, nice to have as a next door neighbor and so forth. Um, but so, so just because they're nice people doing kind things and so forth doesn't prove that the belief system is true. But we do have uh, pointers to reality. Uh, namely, we have very strong reasons for belief in God. Uh, that there is a God who exists and that this God has made human beings with dignity and worth and so forth. And, and so we can argue these things. And during the, my time here at the European Leadership Forum, I've been giving these sorts of arguments. So I'm not going to go into that now. But what we can say is that there is this theory that fits well. There's a coherence to the existence of a, a good God who makes human beings in his image, that we have duties and so forth. This fits very nicely together. But what we see is with the gospel, we have something that adds legs to that theory, that, that, that um, you know, the, in a sense, the abstract is now made concrete in history. So what we do see, however, is that the gospel has power to transform and that the watching world needs to see Christ followers empowered, transformed. Uh, and, and so uh, we read Jesus saying, let your light shine. And Paul saying, do good to all, especially to those of the household of faith. Now, we can also pose the question, to whose world voice do we want our children listening? Karl Marx or Krishna, Muhammad or Mao, or Jesus of Nazareth? Uh, my friend Tom Wolf was, would often ask uh, his Hindu friends, you know, whom would you like your children to, uh, to emulate? Uh, Krishna? Oh, no, please, no. 
uh, Jesus, yes, Jesus. You know, they would, they would con con consistently repeat that. And uh, it, uh, someone whom I, uh, you know, Ravi Zacharias has talked to, about a friend of his who ended up dying uh, or being killed because he had converted from, the, from Islam to the Christian faith. But he said before he died, he said, the, the more I study the world's religions, the more beautiful Jesus appears to me. And that is indeed what we see here. Uh, what we have in Jesus is the good news of a God who steps into our world, shares in our pain and suffering. And that, that this life that was poured out for us, in turn, lives then have been poured out for others, bringing about these transformative fruits. Here is what the historian Tom Holland says. I didn't quote him earlier. I had to kind of cut this out. But uh, he says the notion that a God might have suffered torture Again, this is someone who used to think that the, the classical world, with, you know, the Greco-Roman world with courage and bravery and, 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 and so forth, you know, that this was, the, this was the culture to imitate. He said, he, the more he studied, the, the more he realized how low a view of humanity that many of these people held. He thought he, he was this classicist uh, who embraced these values, but he said, no, I'm actually... I'm, I'm firmly committed to the Christian faith, not to that classical ideal, uh, because you know, there's little regard for those who are poor, little regard for those who are, who, who are disabled and so forth. And so Tom Holland you know, reminds us that it's so easy to take for granted the, the death of Jesus Christ on our behalf and what this meant uh, in the first century. He said the notion that a God might have suffered torture and death on a cross was so shocking as to appear, to appear repulsive. Familiarity, familiarity with the biblical narrative of the crucifixion has dulled our sense of just how completely novel a deity Christ was. Back in 2006, I had contacted, uh, or at 2011, I contacted Rodney Stark, the sociologist at Baylor University, who had identified himself as an agnostic back in 2006. And I wrote to him, I said, where do you stand in your pilgrimage now? And he said, well, I now identify myself as a Christian. He said, I basically wrote myself into the Christian faith. Why? Because he had seen the sorts of things that Tom Holland had seen. He had seen the sorts of things that Brian Stewart, the journalist, had seen, that the gospel was making an impact in people's lives, that societies had been transformed through the power of the gospel. And so he then came as a result to identify himself as a Christian in light of what he had seen going on, the transforming power of the gospel. Let me just go, take us back to India here for a moment. And um, there's the... Uh, you know, there's, you know, the Dalit in India will often be part of, you know, engaging in all sorts of horrific tasks. Uh, and one of them is cleaning up human excrement on streets and, uh, and, and, and moving it away and dumping it somewhere else. But one woman who uh, talks about her own experience as a Dalit, again, this is just part of your, 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 your calling, so to speak. You, this, this is what you're stuck with because of the way that you've lived in a previous life. She said, the first day when I was cleaning the latrines and the drain, my foot slipped and my leg sank into the excrement up to my calf. I screamed and ran away. Then I came home and cried and cried. I knew there was only this work for me. Can you imagine? That's what you're consigned to for the rest of your life. Well, my friend, Dr. Tom Wolfe, who lived in India for a number of years, he said that one of his friends actually had been one of these workers cleaning excrement off of the streets of one of the cities in India. And he heard the message of the gospel. He heard that there was this Jesus who came and gave his life so that we might belong to the family of God, that, that all people are created in the image of God, that all are fundamentally equal. And that this gospel message so transformed his life that he ended up advancing in life to the point where he ended up going to Oxford University to get his PhD. And he summarized his testimony in a nutshell. He said, because of Hinduism, I used to sweep sheet. But because of Jesus, I went to Oxford University. And that is the power of the gospel, my friends. Thanks for listening.